there's things going on during practice and words that are said that directly correlate with what we believe in. The expectations of practice are really high. I know it's a cliche, but I think practices are for coaches and, and games are for players. Hello and welcome to Ahead of the Curve. I am Jonathan Gellner, and thank you so much for joining us. This episode is brought to you by Baseball Cloud. Baseball Cloud's revolutionary software platform brings to life the numbers captured by TrackMan and FlightScope. This provides colleges, players, and facility owners around the world a turnkey product, allowing them to analyze their data using key metrics and custom visualizations on one intuitive user interface. Go to BaseballCloud.com to find out how you can have your own data analytics department for your program. Data has a story to tell, and Baseball Cloud gives it a voice. Now, on today's show, I welcome Pat Bailey, head coach at Oregon State University. Pat was named Oregon State's interim head coach on September 6th after 11 years as an assistant and associate head coach. In 11 years with the Beavers, Bailey has helped the program to a 2018 national championship, three trips to Omaha, and nine overall postseason appearances. He joined the program as an assistant coach in 2008 and was promoted to associate head coach in 2013. He is a two-time national championship coach after guiding George Fox to an NCAA Division III title in 2004, and while there, Bailey coached the Bruins for 12 seasons, amassing over 350 wins, six conference championships, and a National Coach of the Year award in 2004. On the show, Pat talks with us about how the transition has been since Pat Casey retired, but we also talk about how the culture has been built and cultivated And he shares with us a ton of common practices that they use that have made his teams successful season after season. I really think you're going to enjoy this one. And here is Pat Bailey. Coach Bailey, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. I really appreciate you having me on. Definitely. And I want to give a huge shout out to Coach Kozderka for putting us in touch. And I know you two are very close and he had nothing but absolutely glowing things to say about you. And and uh, so I, I'm just thankful that he put us in touch. But, you know, I, I'm really curious to get to know you a little bit better. But if you don't mind, can you give us a little short snapshot of your uh, play or, or just really why you got into to coaching? And I know you've been at several different stops at a lot of different levels, which we'll get into here in just a minute. But take us through that a little bit, if you don't mind. Sure. Well, it started when I was a sophomore in college. I had a teacher. I was majoring in business at the time. And a teacher kept taking me out to dinner and asked me some questions about my future. And one of the things he said to me when we were talking about it was he thought I should be a teacher. And honestly, I laughed at him. <laughs> said, there's no way I, I'm going to be a teacher. Teachers don't make enough money. I want to be able to support my family. Uh, he said, well, you can, you can teach and you can coach. And I said, well, what, what, what would I teach? And he said, well, you can teach business classes. And I didn't even know there was business class taught in high school at the time. And anyhow, um, he talked me into taking an education class. I took the education class. I enjoyed it. And I ended up switching my major to business education. And, and that's how I got started. And my first uh, teaching, coaching assignment, was at Willamette High School down in Eugene, Oregon in 1978. And I taught business classes and I coached football and baseball. And I was a JV baseball coach. Uh, I think I coached JV football. It's been a long time ago, but I know I coached varsity football one year down there. I was JV the rest of the time. And then I became the head baseball coach at Willamette High School in 1982 when I was 26 years old. Was at Willamette High School for six years. While I was there, I got my master's degree at the University of Oregon. And then I, I took a job up at Willamette, or Westland High School in Westland, Oregon. So there in 1984, was coach football and was the head baseball coach there until 1995. And then 1995, I took the head baseball our baseball job at George Fox University and I was the head baseball coach and associate athletic director there mm-hmm. and taught uh, one business class a term 
and then I became the, an assistant coach at Oregon State University in 2007. Yeah, and you guys have been wildly successful, and you know you guys are currently in the middle of, of it as well, and so that's why I'm really excited to to get to talk with you about that, and and you know we can be somewhat reflective. But at the same time, you guys have got a shot to win it again this year, and you guys are going to be really, really good. And so what? So I first want to ask you, you know, what has the transition been like after Coach Casey's retirement and after you got to take the reins of the program? Well, because I've been here for the last 11 years, the transition, I think, has been really easy. I mean, I'm very familiar with Oregon State University. I'm familiar with uh, the climate and the culture at Oregon State University. I was a head baseball coach for 26 years before I got here, so I think I know what I'm doing. And, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going to miss working with Coach Casey. We have very similar philosophies. Uh, we enjoyed each other's company and time that we spent together, but I'm also very excited to be a head coach again. Definitely. And, you know, something that I wanted to ask you, and this is, uh, and this is something that, that is, is a little bit different. You went from being a very successful head coach and to an assistant. And so what was that transition like? Be, you know, you said you had very similar philosophies, so it may not be as drastic, but what was that like taking a step back and, and getting to learn from somebody like Coach Casey? And, you know, what would be the advice for people, for the listeners out there who may be going through that in the future or, or have done that in the past? I know mean, I was at a point in my career that I would not have taken an assistant job if it wasn't with somebody that I really felt that we were similar philosophically. And when, and Coach Case and I have known each other for a long time. I mean, I, when I was the head coach at Westland High School, when Pat was the head coach at George Fox University and started recruiting when he finished his pro career, uh, we got to know each other. So I've known him for uh, a long time. Uh, when we met, we probably spent, the first hour after they got back from 2007 when they won a national championship. We spent, like I said, the first hour just talking about things that had nothing to do with baseball. One of the first questions I asked him is, I said, I, I know, you know, you're obviously the head baseball coach for Oregon State, but tell me, uh, why do you coach? And we probably spent, um, like I said, a minimum one hour talking about being in the man building business that we're here to build men of character. And that's the number one mission that we have as, as coaches. And that's a hundred percent what I agree on. It's the most important thing we do. It's more important than winning national championships. When young men leave our program, we want them to be high character guys. And by the way, I think character triumphs over talent any day of the week. And so uh, I, I just really firmly believe that that's, that's important to us. When guys leave her, we want them to be, if they choose to get married, good husbands. If they choose to have children, be great fathers, uh, be good people in the community, be hard workers, whatever endeavor they choose to, to, to go into. We just want them to be great guys when they leave her. And that's, that's the main part of our mission field. And so you mentioned that that's extremely important to you, and I'm sure that that's something that you guys look for on the recruiting trail. But, you know, I want to know, you guys get guys from different parts of the country with wildly different backgrounds. And it's just, you know, I, I'm really big into how do we build the culture in a way that benefits everyone or especially the way that we want it to be built, because I think it's something that, that can be built. And I'm I'm sure that that you have uh, would agree because you you've been in it for the last ten years. But what what are some things that you guys do to build the culture that you guys want them to see? Well, first and foremost, because of my business background, um, I'm just going to give you some just some business type things. Sure. One of the critical components is that you have to have very clear expectations, and so from the moment that we start recruiting young men. I'll just give you a, uh, just a real quick example. If, mm -hmm. if I, if you called me and you were a sophomore in high school, cause we can't call them they have to call us. Mm -hmm. The first time I talked to you, there'd be three things that I talked to you about. These are the foundation uh, pieces of our program. It's our core beliefs. Number one, we're in the man building business. And so we recruit high character guys. And if you're not a high character guy and you don't buy in uh, to doing things right on and off the field, 
this is not a good place for you to come. Uh, the second thing I tell guys is that we, we want people who are really hard workers who are going to make the most out of their God given talent and hard work to me starts in the classroom and it leaks out on the baseball field. So we, we get really good students. Mm -hmm. And then the third piece for me is you got to make other people more important than yourself. And honestly, between the three, the hardest one is the third one, because we live in a very me, me, me. Uh, Southeast society. So that's one of those things that we work really hard on our program is getting guys to generally love and care for each other and forget about their own personal performance. And it's, it's okay for guys to be mad when they're not playing or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I always tell them, be mad at the coaches. Don't be mad at your teammates, love your teammates, but also communicate with coaches if you're not happy with things and be willing to come in and talk in the office. And because I can tell you right now, coaches aren't going to, play guys because they don't like them they're gonna they're gonna put the best players on the field that are to help a team win mm -hmm. i mean it's what puts food on our table so you know that's one of those things that those those three are just like the core beliefs of our program and, and we we abide by them and we do not deter from them well that's fantastic and and i love that you're getting to share some of the inside of of what that looks like and and so i and i've been guilty of this in the past and this is why i ask for the practicality about it is, as I've been guilty of just saying some of those things. And, you know, I, I'm a true believer that you've got to live what you say, or it's, it's, it's just basically you're, the kids aren't going to buy in. But I also want to uh, ask you if there's any practical ways that you guys kind of put those in, in or, or concrete those as, in a way that they see them all the time, or they hear them all the time, or they're, they just they they're basically brainwashed into believing those because they're around all the time. Or is that just something that that you say this is the expectation and this is how it's going to be done? But and the re and again the reason I ask is because I've been guilty of just saying a couple things and then not touching on them for a long time and then getting mad whenever the kids don't remember what I'm asking them to do. But is there a ways that that you go uh, about doing that practically? Oh, absolutely. It's from the time we, we start practice till we finish, there's things that go on during practice and words that are said that directly correlate with what we believe in. The expectations of practice are really high. I, I, I know it's a cliche, but I think practices are for coaches and, and games are for players. Mm -hmm. And so in practice, I'm the easiest coach in the world to get along with in practice as long as you, you're really focused. Uh, you make a commitment every day when you come to practice to be consistently uh, focused and, and consistent in your performance, and that you just practice hard, um, which d directly correlates in guys doing things right on the field during games. So, you know, there's there's things um, behaviorally that we don't put up with in practice. Uh, from the get-go, we talked to them about that. And again, that goes back to having really clear, clear expectations about what you want your players, how you want your players to perform during practice. So uh, those, those things are the stuff that I talked to you about, the core beliefs, I would say that stuff gets covered every single day in practice in one way or another. I love that. And, and, and again, it's, if it's important to us, then it's something that we need to one live out, but two, we need to cover it uh, a lot more than I think that we do and probably over communicate it. And, and for, for me, I'm just speaking to myself there and, and something that I definitely need to get better at. And another thing that, that I really, I, I hope that, that you can give us some insight into is you guys get some of the best of the best uh, in, in the recruiting world. So there's always going to be some of that internal competition because the guy next to you is extremely good and you're fighting with him for playing time. You're going to love him, but you want to play. And so is there any ways that you guys uh, integrate competition into your practices or anything that you guys track that you guys just love to be able to do during practice to kind of make that competitive level go up a little bit? Well, I'll tell you what, first thing in practice that I think is really important is that you set up practice need to be really organized. Okay. First of all, uh, I'll just give you a really quick example. When we do team defense, once we have everything put into our system, we never spend more than five minutes on any one thing. An example would be like, we do fly ball communication. I'll just go through an example of a day. Sure. First thing we're going to do is we're always going to do something defensive that has to do with our outfielders. So let's say we do fly ball communication. That's going to go four minutes. 
if we do outfield rules and realize the drill has to do with based on where the ball's hit, that's where you throw the ball to. So you minimize bases, you keep the double play in order when you need to. If we do that, that's going to be four or five minutes. Then we'll go to maybe rundowns. That'll be three minutes. Then we'll go first and third defense. That would be five minutes. Then we'll go uh, pitchers, uh, PFPs will be five minutes. So maybe we do a drill we call an island drill. It has to do with pitchers being put out on the island and it's random. Uh, that might be five minutes. Uh, if we do pitchers picks, uh, where we work on picks with three pitchers out at a time, then that's anywhere from four to seven minutes. So it just depends on what we're doing, but we'll never do anything defense that's more than eight minutes. But then we also do it, like, for example, bunt defense. We're going we're to do bunt defense as a minimum three times a week when we practice. So I think having practices that are really organized, and one of the worst things young coaches can do is, let's say we're, we're, we're working on bunt defense today as one of our five-minute segments, and it, it's going terrible. It's just not going good. When I was a young coach, I'd say, we're going to stay and we're going to do this until we do it right. That's mm-hmm. probably the worst thing you can do because you know what happens? It just gets worse. So you're better off stopping the drill, briefly talking, going to the next segment of your practice, bringing it back the next day. So oh. I, I just think that's really important that practices are organized and to the point. I mean, an adult's attention span is eight minutes. So why would you do anything for more than eight minutes? Well, that's very true. And, you know, I, I'm thinking to myself, batting practice, but even our batting practice stations are pro. I mean, how long are your batting practice stations? Eight minutes? No, they're longer than that. But, you know, when they, for example, if we run a 12 minute, if we go 12 minute rotations okay. in batting practice and we have, five segments, 60 minutes total. In those rotations, we never let a hitter swing more than five times. Mm -hmm. And that includes all of our situational stuff. So round one might be butt down first, two hit and runs, uh, two rake and runs, which I used to call run and hit, but we we changed the the verbiage to rake and run because we want the guys to swing the bat. Mm -hmm. That would be be the round one. Round two might be a butt down third, uh, two movements where you have runner second with no outs, two oppos. Uh, round three might be uh, safety squeeze, four scorums. Round four might be a drag or a push and four two strikes. So, and you end up having about six rounds in a 12 minute period. So, we'll probably go four rounds where we have, we do team stuff, one on the field, and then the other two rounds are on their own. But even, even when they hit, like if, they're hitting off the machine. They never get more than five swings. And the reason why is because I don't want it to be swinging just to swing. I mean, it's not an aerobic activity. I want there to be focus and purpose to everything that we do. No, I love that. And and you mentioned that you guys, you use machines on the field as well? We do. The Jazz MP3 machine that they, they introduced last year is the best machine I've ever used. And I really think that it helped, helped us a lot. Uh, last year down the stretch, what we do is we take uh, maybe four or five rounds live off pitchers, and then then we take two or three rounds off the machine. Uh, and it's it set, sits up higher, so it's more the angle of, of what a pitcher actually throws. And it's really easy to adjust from a fastball to a slider to change up whatever you want to throw. So it's just dials you would move it, go back and forth, up and down to get the machine to go uh, left to right, uh, top to down. And it's just, I, I thought it really helped us down the stretch to have the machine on the field. We can't duplicate mm-hmm. an 82 mile an hour slider. Right. Just can't do it as a coach. So, and it throws a really good slider. Uh, we can't duplicate a 94 mile an hour fastball. So, um, those kind of things, we, we've probably started doing, I'm going to say the last third of the season. I thought it really helped us out offensively. Well, I heard that you guys were. You know, you are especially are very into vision training, and you know, the, the more I dig into it, the more I'm like, man, this this is something that hasn't that isn't touched on enough. But would you mind diving into, you know, just why you guys do that, and then maybe some some practical ways that we can we can start to do that within our team setting and within our programs? Absolutely. Uh, I, do you know who Doctor Bill Harrison is? Yes. Okay. Well, Doctor Harrison came up here with his son Ryan. Well, we've had him up a couple of times, but he introduced me uh, to vision training stuff. And one of the things he said to me, and it really made sense, uh, and there's a lot more to it than what I'm going to share with you, but 
what he said to me was that your eyes are muscles. Why would you not train your eyes just like you go and lift weights? Right. And the closer you can get both your eyes to work together in terms of muscles, because when we did eye testing on some of the guys, the eye dominance uh, on some guys is a lot more than others. Hmm. So we do vision training stuff to get both eyes to have to work to get the one eye closer to their dominant eye. So that when they're, when they, they're seeing, they just, they, they track, it has to do with tracking, has to do with seeing the ball bigger and better. Uh, there's just a whole bunch of things going to, and, and they're honestly, they're really simple things. We, we use, uh, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen them on a string, but beads for tracking. The, the strings are about eight feet long and we have five beads. Okay. We have uh, vision boards. Uh, where you have to cross your eyes to see. It's really interesting. It just looks like a regular picture, but when you cross your eyes and, and, you, and you make the three pictures become one in the middle, it becomes three-dimensional. Hmm. And the further you walk away, the more three-dimensional it becomes. Uh, it's actually really cool, but once guys figure out how to cross their eyes and see a picture in the middle, but it forces both your eyes to work is why you cross your eyes to work equally together and you have to see it to fully understand it. But some of the guys can back up and see that pitch. I don't know how they can do it. I can't do it, but they can, they can back up as far as 40 feet and still see the pitcher. Wow. Once their eyes cross. That's and then the other thing we do is we have a machine that throws little like golf ball sized baseballs that are, that are soft. Mm -hmm. And I got the machine from the Jugs corporation. And we catch those balls with our backhand, and we do it for tracking to follow the ball out. And we do that from about 40 feet. So those are, those are some of the basic things we do. And then we do some stuff called lane training, and we do some visualization types stuff that has to do with, with putting two balls out in front without even having to swing the bat, where they, it's a getting down on time, but it's also seeing the baseball and, and them giving us feedback. Uh, verbally after each pitch, just a simple yes or no on how well they saw the ball and whether the ball was in there. But we, I, I firmly believe you hit eight and a half inches to the plate. If that's your strength, then, then you you focus on that area and, and get a pitch in that area. So uh, those are just some of the things that we do that have to do with, with vision training and tracking. And so do you kind of, do you work that into your typical batting practice? So say you've got like, a, I, and and maybe you could walk us through what the different stations are, but would that be one of the stations that you guys would typically do every day? Well, one of the stations we do a lot is called uh, lane training. And then the the vision stuff that's up at McAlexander, which is a, a field house right next to our baseball field, that's one of our stations. Okay. And we and we do that. The, the vision stuff with, between uh, the beads, the vision boards, and I uh, catch the balls. It takes about eight minutes total for a group of four guys. It's yeah. it's really pretty quick, but it's something we do. We try to do it at least five times a week. Perfect. No, I, I I love that. And and again, it's something that that I don't that to be honest with you, I don't do it, but I need to. And I just there's not yeah. a lot of practical examples that I've been able to find because again, it, it's something that that I think is uh, overlooked a little bit. And so have you seen a ton of gains from uh, being able to do that stuff? Well, if you're talking about charting things and seeing if it's helped us, that I don't know, but I, I, I can tell you this. I, it's just one piece of money that you do to help your players be the best they can be. Sure. And just the research and information that, that I've gotten from Dr. Harrison and his son, Ryan, this really helped. And, and I would, Anybody that listens to this, I strongly suggest that you get online and look at Dr. Harrison's stuff. Th those boards that, that, that we got, I, I have two in my briefcase right now. Mm -hmm. And so when we go on the road this spring, I will put those up. And we're taking BP. Um, if you ever came watch us take BP, you'll see those boards on the back side of the portable BP protection screen. So our, our guys are doing those all the time especially early I, I i set them up every day uh later on i don't do it every day but early on we do it every day during bp so i think it doesn't hit and they rotate over to one of those vision boards and they do it before they hit again very cool and i, I know you guys um uh, 
are huge into driveline on the pitching side. And, and I, I got the opportunity to uh, listen to Coach Yeski last year at the ABCA, and he did an absolutely fantastic job of, of really summing up everything that you guys did on the pitching side. But I want to know, what from just from a, from a head coaching point of view, do you guys use a lot of data? Because I know that it's something that is it's becoming more and more popular and in a way that that I get a ton of information from a, a ton of different guests on what they use, but I want to know how to how do we take all of that different stuff and and simplify it? And so, it, it, what do you guys use, and and what have you guys find or found useful within that the the team setting with all the different data that you guys could have? But what do you guys use, and what do you guys like uh, like to use on a daily basis, if if that makes sense? Oh, absolutely, it does and. I'm going to go back to a baseball at five ounces. I think it has 128 stitches on it. I think, I'm not sure, but I think the diameter or the circumference, something like that, nine inches. And we can make baseball as complicated as we want. I, I think it's a complicated sport that guys are really good coaches simplify it. Mm-hmm. And so when you're talking about data and information, and I'll just give you a quick example. Let's sure. let's talk for a minute about launch angle. Mm-hmm. Uh, first of all, everybody has a launch angle. Right. If you look at the parabola of a bat and what, what it's hit, I mean, Biokinetic Research Institute and Bob Kais, who runs Biokinetic Institute, I think Bob's been working with Major League Baseball for almost 40 years now. I remember, oh gosh, it was probably back in like 1996, 97, Bob spoke at the National Clinic, the ABCA Clinic. And he talked about the bat going three and a half to, to all the way up to six inches below the baseball before it comes into contact where the, where you actually hit a baseball, which is out front. When when Bob said that, and then all this launch angle stuff came up, I thought, well, there's other than actually measuring, everybody has a launch angle. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the launch angle thing last year was huge. I'm not hearing it near as much this year. We don't we don't talk about launch angles. A guy's launch angle is a guy's launch angle. Uh, the other thing I'll tell you about launch angle is for the first time in the history of Major League Baseball, there were more strikeouts than there were hits. Mm-hmm. So when all this launch angle stuff came up and got really big about two years ago and really, really big last year and went into this year, because guys were trying to change their degree of uh, launch angle, uh, making it more up to hit more home runs or whatever they're trying to do. Strikeouts went up, and what did pitchers do? Pitchers start throwing the ball up in the zone right. because if if you have if you're trying to create a line thing, it's just going to get higher. And you're and you're, you're the how long you stay on playing with a pitch if your line shangle goes up is going to be less. So JD Martinez, I don't know if you read the article that came out about two months ago, but his line shangle two years ago was I think it was right around. I think it was 12.5 degrees or 13 degrees, something like that. And because he was having a hard time catching up to high pitches, he went back to really trying to to stay on playing longer. His launch angle last year went down to an average of 10.5 degrees. And he still, I think he ended up with, what, 34, 38 home runs mm-hmm. with the Red Sox and had a great year for him. So for me, an example of launch angle thing, how about just pre-pitch rhythm and movement how about getting down on time? Starting your swing with your lower half means that you're down on time, and letting your launch angle be your launch angle based on how you were, how God made you. <laughs> I mean, everybody, everybody's different. Everybody has different arm lengths, different finger lengths. Some guys' fingers are thicker than others. I mean, come on. The launch angle thing, me personally, has driven me crazy. I, I just, I don't think it's not. It, for me, it's a non page Whatever guy's launch angle is, a guy's launch angle is. So that that's an example of looking at information. And there was so much stuff on it when it really became popular. And, and like I said, you're not seeing so much stuff on it right now. Uh, spin rate and things like that with TrackMan data and Rhapsody information. Uh, I think all that stuff's really good. I think it's a good measurement in terms of looking at guys when you're recruiting and making decisions on recruiting. Uh, but to sit there and talk to a guy about his spin rate and how that needs to change your stuff doesn't have to do with how God made you and 
your arm angle and the, and the speed with which the ball comes off your fingers. I don't think you can change that. So anyhow, I think the information is good as long as it's used properly. I don't think you need to overload your players with that information. Let me take a few seconds to tell you guys about OnBaseU. OnBase University is an organization that studies how the human body moves in baseball and softball. They offer certification seminars that teach coaches, trainers, and medical professionals how to assess an athlete's physical ability to perform movement patterns that are specific to hitting and pitching. For example, they just put up a blog post on their website, onbaseu.com, that discussed why hip internal rotation is important in hitting and how they evaluate it with their OnBaseU screen. If you want to learn more about OnBaseU, I did a podcast with the OnBaseU founder, Dr. Greg Rose, episode 78, and he talked about how he modeled the screen after golf assessments that he created for TPI. They are hosting pitching and hitting seminars in Phoenix, Newark, and Houston over the next few months. I will be attending one soon, and I hope to see you there. Sure, absolutely, and you know it's, it's something that, again, I think it's going to get more and more prevalent just because you can set a number to this or that. And I think that, that we as coaches need to understand it just so we can break it down for the players whenever they're given all of that information as well. But you mentioned that, that it helps you guys on the recruiting trail and you guys have a ton of, of former players that went on to be first round picks and may that were lower, lower drafted or may not even have been drafted and so I, I want to know, uh, what are you guys looking for whenever you are recruiting? And you mentioned that, that you want them to be great men off the field first, but whenever you're going and watching them play, what are some of the things that you guys are looking for? Well, I, I think one of the key things is when, when you recruit guys, just, they're really good students. And it's not necessarily because they're smarter than other people. It's because they're hard workers. Yeah, that's good. And so I think that, that's the first thing. The other thing is if, if young men are really good students in high school, I'm talking three, five and higher GPA guys. If they're really good students in high school, uh, it's probably because they're doing things right on and off the field. When young men are doing things that are morally wrong on and off the field and doing stuff that's inhibiting their performance in the classroom and on the field, you know, that's, they're just, you know, their priorities are out of whack. Mm-hmm. And you recruit very many of those guys, and they'll have a negative impact on your program. So, you know, and then there's there's things that factor in where guys aren't getting good grades. Maybe uh, a key member of the family died. Uh, Mom and dad got divorced. You know, things like that that also work into young men not getting as good grades as they should in high school, and they end up doing really well in college. So you have to look at all those factors as well. No, I love that, and and that's definitely the case and and i'm sure that you guys take that on a case-by-case basis and and go from there and and so you're you're getting you're getting guys now that are ranked nationally and they're coming in as some of the best the top of top of their class and for me you know we all want to get better individually we all want to get better individually we all want to get better as a team and so whenever you're getting those guys especially whenever you get them in several different or the same position in, in several different classes and they're having to compete every single day. How do you how do you kind of sell the the individual development within the team setting, maybe even if they're not playing every single day? And what what does that individual player development look like uh within uh the Oregon State setting? Sure. Well, I think the first thing is like I told you at the very beginning, we're we're a teaching program mm-hmm. and I think guys improve and get better because we do teach. I also think it's because the type of guys that we get in here, they're learners. And I, and I think if you're a learner, you're, you know, your learning curve is going to be all higher. If you're willing to, uh, to uh, take, and I also have this guy's personality because every guy's different. Some guys are bigger risk takers than others. You know, when I was a young, young coach, I used to think, well, that guy's not very coachable. Well, as I've grown as a coach, over the years, this is my 41st year of coaching. I don't think that's true at all. I think it has to do with if a guy hit 450, 500 in high school, and he's not a big risk taker, his learning curve is not going to be as sharp as a guy who another guy who hit four or 500 in high school and is a big risk taker. His learning curve is going to be higher because he's willing to take risks to change things to get better. So part of that is you have to look at a guy's personality as well. 
Perfect, perfect. And you know that that's something that that I have continued to grow myself. I, I think that my and this sounds so weird, but I think that my least amount of learning came within the actual school setting. And it's it's crazy that once you get them locked in and and get them to believe in something that that helps them to grow themselves, I think that that you've won them over, and I think you've got them from there. Yeah. Well, the first thing they have to do is they have to they have to trust you. If they, if they don't trust what you're teaching is correct, they, they, there's not going to be buy-in. And so you have to, you know, you have to be knowledgeable on what you're talking about. You're not, guys are really smart. You can't fool them. Uh, you have to be honest. If there is something that you don't know and ask you a question, tell them you don't know and you'll look it up or you'll get some help from somebody else. So I, kids aren't stupid. They stay, see through coaches really quick. Mm-hmm. So you can't, you can't fool people. So the trust thing I think is really important. And once they trust you and sometimes it takes a guy failing a lot before they'll come to you and say, Hey coach, I need your help. Some guys want help. The flip side, it was the other extreme is a guy go over four and he'll want to go spend two hours in, in the batting cage. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we obviously can't spend two hours with them, but they'll go in there by themselves for two hours to hit because they went over four. And that's silly. I mean, everybody's going to have all for four days. Right. So it's just, um, I think that the key thing is, is our profession is no different than being a good doctor, a good lawyer, or a physicist, or a nuclear engineer, whatever it is you're doing. If you want to be great at it, you, you got you to study and, and you got to look at information. And, you know, as you mature as a coach, you filter information, you take information you think's good that uh, you you believe in, you trust, and, and then you, you throw the other information out. So um, you do what you think is going to help you and your program and get better. But the when you talk about our players coming in, you said a, a few minutes ago about talent. We get a lot of talented players, mm-hmm. and I really uh, believe the key when you get a lot of talented players coming in is to buy into the team concept. And if they buy into the team concept and do things in, in your program, that will help them to really literally care for one another like a brotherhood and, and fall in love with each other uh, as a brotherhood. It, it's, it's a key to winning. It's a, it's a key ingredient to winning. And that's where the character piece really comes in and matters. And that's, that's where making other people more important than yourself matter. You know, I was talking yesterday, we finished the hitting camp and I told them, I said, awards are great, but they're just, they're inanimate objects. They're not going to make you happy. Just like a big house isn't going to make you happy. A brand new car is not going to make you happy. A brand new car after you've had it for for a couple of months takes from point A to point B. And as long as you take care of it, it's going to continue to take you from point A to point B, but it's not going to, it's not going to matter in terms of, of how you feel about it. The, the key to being happy is making other people more important than yourself. And, and the second key to being happy is to just, uh, it's about relationships. It's everybody wants to be accepted unconditionally and they want to be unconditionally loved. And so coaches have to learn that guys have different personalities. Mm-hmm. And if they know that you really care, they, that you really care about them and you have your best interest or their best interest in mind. And then it's not about you as a coach, not about you winning as a coach. It's about helping them become men and helping them become good teammates and helping them to really just in, enjoy and care for one another. Then the, the winning part takes care of itself. So is that something that, Let's say that Coach Bailey went back and told his 21, 22-year-old first-year coach self. Would that be what you would what you would basically tell yourself? Oh my goodness! When I first started coaching, you know, I cared about, and I don't, I don't I'm not going to say I didn't care about the kids, mm-hmm. but I'm not going to lie. I think I cared more about winning than I did the kids, and I think that all changed when my wife and I started having children. I think that really helped because I. There's times when I thought, now, if that was my son or that was my daughter, would I talk to them that way? Mm-hmm. And, and you would. So I think that part helped. Uh, when I was 26 years old, uh, my first year as a head coach, I contacted 
I got spinal meningitis. As we were getting ready to go into oh, wow. the state playoff playoffs when I was going to High School, and I was in critical condition for three days. I was in the hospital for two weeks. There were 17 cases in Lane County, which is the county in, in Eugene, Oregon. Twelve of those cases died. I was one of five that lived, and I was the only one of five that didn't lose fingers or toes. Wow. And I had to have 40 pints of blood. Oh uh, why I was in the hospital. Anyhow, all that for me made me realize just it made me reevaluate what, what is really important in life. And it, it had a huge impact on my life. And I think that probably helped change things too. Wow, man, that's, that's, I did not know that story. And that is, that's crazy. Like, that's crazy. And I'm, I'm, yeah. saying, wow, that would definitely change my perspective as well. And, and, you know, on the same, on the same uh, thing or the same, same uh, tone, uh, I think, you know, most of us as young head or well, not my head coach myself, but young coaches, I think we all kind of feel like that because that's kind of, at least this is how I felt whenever I was 21 and I was teaching a uh, high school age kids, I was teaching senior, a senior government class and I was like three years older. I felt like the relationships was the last thing that I wanted to do because I didn't want to seem like their friend. and. You know, the the more that, that I get to speak with awesome coaches as yourself and, and guys who have been in it for a long, long time, that seems to be the foundation of literally everything because we can we can learn as much as we want and we can be we can win as many games as we want, but if we're not building relationships with our players, I think we we're doing it in, in a way that is not gonna be satisfying in the long run. Oh, I hundred percent agree. And you know, when I first started teaching coach, I was 22, so I was about your age as well. And one of the things I learned in a hurry, especially in the classroom, is you're not there to be their buddies. Mm-hmm. You're there to mentor them. Right. And it's like I've told people, I have zero interest in having an 18-year-old as a friend. <laughs> I'm there to be a father figure for them. I'm there to love them unconditionally. I'm there to mentor them and help them become men. And so I, I think that's the key relationship wise for a coach versus a player to be a, when parents hand the baton to coaches in college uh, to help out. And let's just talk about high school for a minute. Cause sure. it sounds like you're, you, you're, are you currently a high school coach? Correct. Yes. Okay. Well, think about this. I bet you in high school, the amount of time you spent with your players and a daily basis is more time than they spent at home with their parents. Yep. So the the critical role that you fill in those guys' lives, they're going to remember things 25 years from now that you said that are going to have an impact on their lives, both positive and negative. And I'll just give you a really clear example of that. About, uh, I'm going to say 1992, I had a young man in a class, a business law class, and he came up right before the final and he said, can you give me my total points uh, so far and the points that, how many points that I could have gotten, how many points I actually have, what my, my percentage is. And I, I showed him, uh, I put it on a piece of paper, and I said, I know what you're asking. You're a really smart guy. You're a straight-A student. And you want to know the minimum amount you have to get on your final and still get an A in this class. And he goes, well, I have a lot of finals next week. And I said, if you don't do your best on this final, you're going to be disappointed. Mm-hmm. might not be disappointed now, but if you take shortcuts now, you're going to do it later on. So he took the final and he got like a 78 and just barely had enough to get an A versus an A minus. And I wrote on his paper, I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was like weak performance. I expect more out of you. If you take shortcuts now, you're going to take shortcuts later on in life. Mm-hmm. He calls me when he's 32 years old. And said he was so mad at me when, when he got his paper back, but he said, Your comments have had a direct impact on my life and everything I've done, whether it's being a husband, a father, a worker, I always think about that and I always give my best in everything I do. Wow. And I, I mean that was one of those things where I didn't think that was that big of a deal other than I was mad at him. Because <laughs> he was also an athlete. He he played football in college. So anyhow, I mean you just don't know the things that you're going to say that are going to have a huge impact on young people's lives. So 
we have a major opportunity to have both a positive influence and potentially a negative influence on a, on a person's future. And the last thing I'll tell you that's really important with, with talking to your student athletes, never attack the person. You can attack the behavior and try to change behavior. The person's okay. The behavior might not be acceptable. So you got to be really careful what you say to your student athletes in terms of it, of how you say it. And even the tone that it's said at, uh, I think is really important, but it has to, you have to attack behavior. Don't, don't attack the person. I love that. And that's, that is extremely, extremely good. And, and so, you know, coach, whenever I'm trying to be more reflective and, uh, just looking back and, and continuing to look forward and, and continuing to try and, and better myself. And that's really, you know, why I, uh, started the podcast, but, Whenever you look back, let's say in 30 years, whenever you're done coaching and you decide to finally hang them up and, and you look back and, and on the run that you guys have had and, and the guy and the run that you're currently on and you've won three titles in, in the past 12 years and you look back and, and you're, let's say you're just having a conversation and someone asks you this and just, you know, and answer this however you may, but what would you say that you guys do differently? Because from, for the most part, everyone has access to the same recruits. Everyone has access to the same data and the same the same ninety foot bases and the same five ounce baseball that you that you mentioned earlier. But if you looked back and, and you just said, "Man, I, I really truly think that this is what we do differently than everybody else," what would that be? Well, I think first and foremost, what we've been talking about we're we're in the mad building and the relationship business, and I really firmly and fully from the bottom of my heart that if if young men know that they that you really care for for them and that they trust you uh you're going to have a huge impact and influence on their lives that'd be the first thing the second thing is i think it's really important that a coach is a student of the game and there's a reason why god gave us two ears and and one mouth and that's to be a learner and a listener Mm. and it's uh, i it's funny because yesterday I told the young people in our baseball camp, isn't it interesting? Your ears have no protection, but your tongue has protection of both your teeth and your lips. There's and the other reason why I think that we were created that way is because we need to listen more and talk less. Mm -hmm. And so I I just think it's important that, that you really uh, try to put your, yourself in your, in your player's shoes and, and see where they're at in life and help them out. So uh, I just think all those things are really critical. And and going to clinics, I remember when I was 28 years old, I wanted to be a college coach. And I, I wrote down uh, goals. And one of the things I wrote down at the time was, I'm going to read at least one book a month, whether it's a baseball book. or it's, And I read a lot of leadership books, mm-hmm. uh, John Maxwell books. Uh, I think if you're going to be a, uh, a coach you, if, and you're going to be a leader, you better understand what leadership is. And so I, I made a commitment that I was going to read at least one book a month. I made a commitment that I was going to go to at least two clinics a year. And I, I've been to the American Baseball Coach Association clinic uh, since 1987, probably every year, but maybe five or six uh, during that time. So uh, I just think it's really important that, that you you have an open mind and listen to other people and learn from them and get, and you, you know, even if you get, if you went to like, when I go to the ABCA clinic next week, when I go to all those sessions, first of all, I want to get there early enough where I'm going to be close and up front where I can actually listen and learn and, and take notes and do whatever I need to do. But secondly, be open-minded enough that, Hey, you know, this is the way I've done this the last 15 years, but maybe this is a better way. Mm-hmm. And just be open minded in terms of what works and what doesn't work, and maybe make an adjustment. Uh, one of the things that we've done more the last couple of years in practice, and I think it's really helped our guys out, is we've created more randomness in practice. Okay. And I'll just give you an example. We combine our outfield rules and relays with our fly ball communication. And we also this year added runners to the fly ball communication part. So we have runners in different situations. So our outfielders are actually having to, you know, do in-game decision making, along with our infielders in terms of proper alignment based on where the ball is hitting, where the runner is located. So uh, between a ground ball and a fly ball, those type of things, where it's just out, everything goes to the outfield. None of it stays in the infield. It's either a fly ball or a base set. 
uh, where they they have to make in-game decisions. And it, there's also a randomness in it in terms of a ground uh, ground ball base set, line drive base set, a fly ball that's really deep. It's because sometimes you have to double cut fly balls mm-hmm. because if it gets over the cut and there's a runner at second, you could score from second. So just all that stuff gets added in uh, to combine those. And we've also combined our first and third in our bunt defenses. Uh, Nate came up with the island drill. So, you know, we, we tried try to do more things. Because when you have randomness in practice, it puts more pressure on your team. And I think the more in-game decision-making, randomness and pressure that occurs, the easier the game's going to be when you actually play the game. Sure. I and mean, we want them to be better decision makers than how, and this is something that, that I've been all in on in the past couple of months, just because I, I, I keep hearing it. And, and obviously with, with, uh, with yourself and, and other people talking about it that are, be- that are better than me, I'm like, man, I, I need to listen. But if we're, if we're asking them to make better decisions, then how are we practicing that? And you've mentioned the Island drill a couple of times. Do you mind digging into that a little bit? Yeah, you just, we call it the Island drill because Nate has one pitcher at a time. Because everything else we do, we have three pitchers out there. Because you're when you run practice, you're trying to utilize time as best as you can. And so we have multiple drills going. Like when we do PFPs, we have three pitchers out there at a time while we're doing PFPs. Mm-hmm. So that a lot of things are going on. Uh, but the island drill, pitcher goes out to the mound. It's just a pitcher in the infield. And you create different scenarios. And you just, you know, it's just random stuff. Runner at first base, no out. You know, Nate's either going to, he's going to bunt, he's going to drag, he's going to push, he's going to uh, hit a ground ball where a uh, pitcher has to turn a double play, whatever it is, the, the play is going to involve the pitcher. And so that's, that's the island drill. You might have a, a guy at first base and he's stealing and a catcher has to throw him out and a pitcher has to be quick to the play. It just involves everything that happens within an infield during the game that involves the pitcher. So that's what the island drill is. Well, perfect. So before you before you go, I've got one more question for you, and this is probably you know my favorite question that that I ask any any coach because we're in it for the kids. We're in it to build better men, to build better baseball players. But say you show up to practice tomorrow or whenever you guys are starting practice, and you say, "Hey guys, we're going to do this drill today, or we're going to do this thing in practice," and they just erupt because they absolutely love it. What would that thing or things be? Gosh, that's a great question. They we do a thing called a uh, a hustle scrimmage or two pitch. Uh, they really enjoy doing that. Whenever I tell them today's a grip and rip day, they just it's a day where they just get to hit without having to do it, which we rarely do. Us uh, in practice, they love doing that. You know, maybe uh, you you've been working really hard and you come up with a competition day which we've done a few times where we just do competitive type things, the entire practice, uh, whether it's, I, I created a long time ago, what I call a 30 foot drag game. And it's the bases are 30 feet and, and you play a game with that and, and you score points based on whether the guy's safe or out at first base. That, if they're safe, the point, if they're out, they don't get any points and they get three outs and you rotate and you have teams and you run a, you, you know, you run a tournament with it. Uh, you can even play, and this sounds silly, but, uh, there's been a few times since I've been a college coach where we've actually played over the line tournaments, <laughs> fun. which is fun. But I mean, you got to you're you're there to teach and coach. So those days they don't happen a super lot. The part about gripping and ripping that happens quite a bit. Hustle scrimmage or two pitch at the end of practice, uh, we do that quite a bit too on days that we don't scrimmage. So, you know, you, you got to pick your slots. You can't do that kind of stuff all the time. I mean, the, the funnest part about baseball is winning. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's just be honest about it. That's when they, when they tear that scoreboard down, they get quite keep and score. And then, then uh, you can just go out and do whatever you want. But until they do, you're there to teach. You're there to mentor. You're there to build relationships and you're there to help guys. And so, um, I think that part's really important. The last thing I want to say before we quit, sure. uh, when you're talking about a relationship business, 10 years from now, if I wasn't coaching, do you think any of our players would care how much we want or would you think they'd care more about 
the impact we had on their lives and the relationships we developed with them. I mean, one of the coolest things I ever have done as a coach is I'm, uh, Jake Rodriguez is now on our staff. Jake was a catcher for us. Uh, he finished and uh, he was, was drafted in 13 when we went to the World Series in 2013. And then when he got released, he came back and started working with us. I'm, I married him and his wife. Oh, wow. I mean, that, that kind of stuff to me is way more important than the baseball side of it. It's something I'll never forget. And to have an opportunity to do that for one of my former players was just amazing. I had to get my pastor's license or whatever you want to mm-hmm. call it to be able to marry him because I needed a license so that the marriage was legal. But I've, and since then, I've, I've married uh, four couples. So, wow, that's awesome. Um, including my son and, and my daughter in law. So it, it's just, you know, uh, those kind of things have more meaning than the actual wins and and the journey, you know, people ask me about last year, you know, if you, if you're, if you're coaching just to win a national championship and you finally win a national championship, that's going to be empty, an empty feeling. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody wants to win a national championship. Very few people get an opportunity. I mean, I've been blessed. I've been in a state championship in high school, won a national championship at George Fox, had an opportunity to be a part of a national championship here at Oregon state. I mean, I've been fortunate. Uh, there's a lot of great coaches out there that have never got to experience what I've got to experience. But one of the things I can tell you is that the national championship part is not as important as, as building that. And the national championship part is just a byproduct of what, what you've done during the course of the year. And, and we were blessed with a lot of talent last year. I mean, Nick Madrigal, Caden Grenier, Trevor Larnick, all first round draft pick guys. Stephen Kwan developed into a great baseball player. And the the common thread between all those guys for me is they were what I would call legacy guys. They were guys that were really hard workers, but they also had an impact on your team. And and they helped our team. Those guys live and put our team in a better place than when they found it, if that makes sense. So, you know, they had a huge impact on our team and our program. And not just as baseball players, but as human beings. No, that's fantastic. Well, Coach, I I can't think of a better way to end the show than that. But if there are any listeners who, you know, would love to get in touch with you and just touch base or just say hello, uh, what would be the best way to do that? Uh, By email, probably, to start with. And and I'm at a a point where I love helping young coaches out. Okay. Uh, So my email address is pat.bailey, B-A-I-L-E-Y at Oregon State, and you have to spell it Oregon State, .edu for education. Awesome. Well, I am going to open up the mic for you, and is there anything else that you'd like to tell our listeners before you go? No, I just really appreciate the opportunity to talk, and and uh, being a, a guy that's been in the profession for a while, I just I just hope that coaches really buy into what I talked about in terms of this being a relationship build business, and we're here to build that because it's going to make our country better if, if coaches buy into that because we have a huge impact on young people's lives. Thank you for listening to Ahead of the Curve. Before you go, I'd love to be able to get in touch with you, and we have several different ways of doing so. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at AOTC underscore podcast. You can join the AOTC Coaches Facebook group. And if you want to be a part of the mini clinic emails, both of those links are listed below. If you enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a rating or review to help others find and stay ahead of the curve.